All right, it says we are live, good people. So I'm gonna refresh this page so that way we can get the link up and share it across our profiles and all that good stuff. Let's see here. Make sure Facebook cooperates too. <clears throat> it gets fickle. All right, I see us. Let me make sure it, the audience is public. I had that happen once. Did a whole live, y'all, and it was not visible. <laughs> All right. You should be able to see it. So check your pages, check your profiles. Okay. Ah, got it. You got it? You got it. Awesome. Well, you have some great lighting, Tawana. Thank you. Listen, daylight bulbs, daylight bulbs, they make a difference. They really do. I see. <laughs> all right. Everybody situated. We're all here. We're well. Yes, All right. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining today's talk, Transcend with Bootstrap Dreams. If you are here live with us, make sure to hashtag Live Squad so we can acknowledge you. We really want to celebrate you for being here tonight. If you watch us on the replay, please make sure to hashtag replay so we can catch up with you there too. This is Real Talk with Transcend with Bootstrap Dreams. I am Tawana and I have an amazing panel here with me tonight. I'm so excited because this is the first panel of the talks that we have. I can't believe it's been 12 already. This little time is going by so quickly. Everybody, I want you all to introduce yourselves. Let the people know who they are going to be sharing with tonight, vibing with tonight, and just really having this collective experience. So Angel, you would like to start? Of course. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Antonia um, Cologne. Uh, some of you are watching may know me as Angel. I, I am 35. I am a mom. I am recently divorced. Well, I say recently because it's been yeah, four it's years, been but I am recently divorced. <laughs> 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 a college grad, a full time mom, full time employee, um, and just living existing and excelling. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for having me tonight. Thank you for your willingness to be here. Patrice. Uh, I am Patrice Spikes. I am a mother, a wife, um, and a caregiver. Mm -hmm. um, I am 35. I am a retail store manager, actually. Um, uh -huh. I just changed companies. I was with, last time I was with you, I was with, um, I just started the job with Ross. Okay. So, um, it's two months now, been with yes. Ross. Um, so I'm the store manager in the Savannah location. Yes. Um, living, laughing, and loving. I love that. I know you're going to bring them so much excellence. All right, Lawrence. Introduce yourself. Good evening, everybody. My name is Lawrence Team the Four. Um, everybody says, "Why do you put the fourth on it?" Because I guess because growing up in my household, we had the third always going around, so we they had to distinguish us somehow. But um, <laughs> glad to be here. I'm sorry that I am not pictured on camera. I'm having some technical difficulties with my camera. I uh, hope to get that fixed soon. But I, um, I'm 43 years old. I am a father. Um, I have been living in corporate America, I guess you could say, for the last 15 years. But my mm. passions are really photography and music. Angel can nice. attest to that. Um, so I pretty much stay busy between uh, being a father with sports with my two boys and keeping my little girl um, happy, my little princess happy with her little uh, playing dress up in dolls every now and then. <laughs> I, oh, nice. say. Um, uh -huh. I keep myself busy. Um, just relocated back to Alabama uh, from Atlanta. Uh, was there for three years uh, mm -hmm. living in Atlanta. Loved it. So yeah. um, Patricia was talking about movies in Savannah. That's excellent. I love Savannah. Love the beach. I do too. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's a little bit about me. So I'm excited uh, to be on this panel. Um, I've been on panels before, but this is the first time we're um, approaching this subject. And I think it's a great subject to uh, have around this time, uh, around the holidays, people dealing with uh, loss of loved ones and things like that. So I thank you for the opportunity. I thank you for the other panelists and uh, looking for a great conversation tonight. 
Oh, looking forward to it as well. All right, Bradford, bring us on in for the introduction. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Bradford Coleman. I'm a licensed professional counselor. I'm the owner and therapist at Lithos Counseling and Consulting. I also do business as Lithos Health. Uh, originally based in Valdosta, but now that uh, so much has gone virtual, we're offering services across the entire state of Georgia. Um, and I'm just so grateful for this opportunity. Uh, just as everyone has kind of shared, this is a much needed topic. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get a lot of uh, discussion. Right. Um, and I hope that we can inspire people and help people just from sharing our stories um, and some tips and ideas, especially during this holiday season especially during this holiday season. I can't thank you guys enough for being here tonight because again, I mean, this is real. This is real life, you know, and this has been one heck of a year. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of shockers, boom, bangs, you know, explosions on both extremes, right? Great. And then like, are you serious? Like, it's, just, it's been very interesting. And so you all being here means so much to us. Uh, it's, 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 it's much bigger than me. Um, so we're going to, uh, you know, let God move and use your your experiences, your testimonies to really help inspire somebody. This is going to touch somebody, whether they see it today, whether they see it three days from now, somebody's life will be positively impacted from what you share. So thank you all so much. Now, before we really get into the conversation, there is one question, only one question, because this is totally unscripted, that I really like to ask. And it's when you hear the word transcend, what comes to mind? And so, Angel, if you want to start and then we just kind of round, round, round okay. Robin. Yeah, that's where you are on my screen. I know, by default, you're my immediate. <laughs> I am first. Well, when I hear the word transcend, I think about uh, going above and beyond um, expectations that, mm -hmm. you know, we set forth for ourselves. And that can apply, like you mentioned earlier, um, in any aspect of our lives. And I believe that in some extent, you know, we all want to excel, in, excel in all of our doing. So like I stated, yes. it could be in your career, it could be in your health, on your job, in relationships. So of course, we all want to set goals for whatever it is. And we want to excel at that. So that's what comes to mind. I love that. Patrice, what comes to mind when you hear the word transcend? Um, so the first thing that comes to my mind is to overcome, mm. beat it. Um, <laughs> to, I mean, just, you know, that's, that's, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Like I've overcome, I've, I've transcended. It's, it's over. I'm done. I've gotten over it. I'm, I'm moving forward, pressing forward. Um, really just kind of able to look back on something and be like, yeah, it's done. Yes. The next thing. I love that. I love mm -hmm. that. How about you, Lawrence? Um, you know, me and Bradford are going to have a hard time following uh, these beautiful ladies' <laughs> answers, responses. I'll mix it but, up. Um, <laughs> you know, just to, just to piggyback off what they were saying, and when I hear transcend, I think about rising above, um, and, and it goes beyond goals and and or any type of uh limits that you set for yourself it's mm -hmm. overcoming any of the world challenges um mm. like you said 2020 has just been a challenging year within itself um from you know what's going on in the political world uh, yeah. the social world you know with racism and all those things like that from covid to being shut in since march um yes. it's just many different things you have to overcome so to transcend uh to put it into that context means to me that you can rise above you know any type of challenge that's put in your way and it's a process to that and you know when people think you can just just jump over a hurdle sometimes you have to work over that and so when i think of transcend i think of just climbing um step by step and getting mm -hmm. help from others to do that as well absolutely that's so good and bradford what comes to mind for you uh, just as he said, it's so difficult to follow what everyone said. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I thank you so much again this opportunity. So just whenever I hear that word, mm -hmm. I think of uh, going beyond our limitations, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and and going beyond and then making meaning, you yeah. know, making meaning of our experiences of. Um, even things that we don't quite understand. So you can transcend and you're making you're making sense of it. What previously didn't make sense. Yes, that's so good. Now, when we talk about going above and beyond, overcoming challenges, life, the world, 
making sense of things that don't make sense. Like this, this is good. This definition here, it just pintails, right? It daisy tails off of everything because you all each have your own story, right? We all have one, but you all have stories that I, I just don't think other people can comprehend, right? And when things happen in your life that have happened in your lives, I'm sure you get how, how do you do it? Right? Like how in the world do you stay so encouraged? How in the world do you stay so positive? How in the world do you keep hoping and going forward? Like how do you just have the gumption to look forward to continue living, right? So share some, I'll mix it up. I'll start with Lawrence. <laughs> share, <laughs> I'll mix it up. Lawrence, if you don't mind, share uh, some of your personal experience. What, it, what you know, how far you want to go with it is up to you. But give us a brief on your story and some of the things that you have experienced so that people will understand why we are having this topic and this conversation. Oh, definitely. Um, and thank you. Uh, I would say if I want to make this, uh, I guess you could say a long story short. I don't want to, you know, uh, bring anybody to tears or anything like that. But I got uh, my paper towel ready. <laughs> you have your paper towel. I got it ready. Um, and it's Listen. funny because I, you know, it took me till maybe a couple of years ago to understand that it's okay for men to cry. But yes, um, I'll definitely try not to on, in this topic. But um, I guess I would start with uh, 1996, um, 97. Um, mm -hmm. I decided to go to the military after a year, spending a year at UAB, um, made a decision to help my mom out with some of the college uh, fees and things like that. So before I left, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, um, uh, told me that if it's any other thing, the last thing that I do, I'm going to see you graduate from the military. I'm going to see your sister graduate from high school and see all of you guys, you know, go on to greatness. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's crazy because I was at station at Fort Jackson in South Carolina in the Army, and mm -hmm. um, she actually made the trip up in that June when I graduated to see me graduate. And um, the day after they were to return back to Alabama from South Carolina, her my mom drove up along with my father and my sister. Um, mm -hmm. She had a major stroke, and I found out the next day because I got a phone call. They let us kind of go out of the town after we graduated, and I got a yeah. phone call uh, upon returning to base that from the Red Cross saying that my grandmother had fell ill and that they had her in the hospital, and they were pretty much waiting for me to get back to Alabama um, wow. before they made a decision. So that was, I mean, I had experienced some type of loss in some type of ways growing up. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. from the family pet to the dog to the millions of goldfish I wanted to fare. But this one was the first real one when it felt kind of real um, yeah. that I had that loss. And um, she actually got to see me graduate. So I guess that was one of those self-fulfilling prophecies. She did get to see me graduate, but that was the first major blow that I took. And um, I'm a very family oriented person. We have a very big and close knit family. So mm -hmm. that was the one thing that pulled me through that having my mom there, my brothers and my sister there um, mm -hmm. kind of helped us to go on. Um, wow. Fast forward, fast forward to uh, 2005. Mm -hmm. um, I actually started, um, it was actually my first day on a new job in my corporate America career, I guess you can call it. And um, upon returning home uh, to stop in and check, tell my mom how I always used to do, because I literally stayed right around the corner from her, um, she wasn't at home. And I was like, where's mom? And, mm -hmm. you know, they said, well, you know, she had had a call for like the last week or so. So she went to the hospital earlier just to get the call checked out. Well, that call turned out to be that she had cancer um, that started her breast and had spread to her lungs. Um, so they caught that in 2005 and she courageously fought it, uh, went in and out of, um, went in and out of, uh, of the hospital with different treatments all the way up until 2009, where it became, uh, so bad it had spread into her, uh, spine and then into her brain. So from there, uh, we pretty much knew that the day would come, you know, so, you know, even though, you know, the day is coming. You never know the exact day. You can never really prepare yourself for that. Mm -hmm. Well, about two and a half weeks <laughs> before that date, my father uh, went on a business trip out of town. Um, 
And one day I'm getting prepared for work and I get a phone call from my uncle, uh, my uncle Bruce, his, his brother, uh, telling me that my father had a major heart attack and they could not revive him. So that was like, that was like a whoa out of nowhere. You know, I lost my father and um, I'll never forget it. My mother, uh, even though she was not fully cognitive, she still, you know, she still was, you know, with us. And i would never forget, I immediately left my apartment and ran over to my mom's house and I told her, you know, hey, dad's gone. And mm-hmm. um, and I'll never forget it. She said, your dad's dead? And I was like, yeah. And she kind of, a tear just came to her eye. So I knew mm-hmm. she recognized what I was saying and what had happened. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, we had to wait a little while because, again, we had to fly up there and get his body returned back to Alabama uh, I mean, for the funeral and everything. And I'll never forget, we buried him on a Thursday. And, of course, my mom couldn't travel because, again, she was yeah. – um, she was really convalesced to the bed or, you know, to around the house. So um, upon returning, um, she, we came back and she was very sick. So we took her to the hospital that Thursday. And I'll never forget that uh, the doctors kind of told us, hey, we're going to move her to a hospice. So we can get her a room. Um, mm-hmm. They were going to move her that following Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, I'll never forget that Sunday, if I don't, if I can if I can remember, it snowed that Sunday in Atlanta because I wound up going to a Atlanta Hawks game because I love LeBron James. So I went to see the Cavaliers play that week, and I never, I never forget riding back in snow. And I was mm-hmm. like, my mom would love this because living, we used to live in Maryland, and wow. uh, she would always, she would love the snow, although I hated it. Um, yeah. She loved the snow. I was like, she really loved to see this. So you know, I was taking pictures and videos of them flying back down 285 uh back to alabama not 25 85 and uh that two uh that monday right before uh we she was gonna we were gonna move her she passed away as well so Mm. within the span of two Mm. weeks i lost my mother and my father Mm. so that was like a double punch in the gut um and at the time all i i didn't cry i didn't shed a tear uh Mm -hmm. And I couldn't even go to my mom's wake. I did go to the funeral, and I never forget. Mm-hmm. I told myself even before going to the going into the funeral, I was mm-hmm. not going to cry because I'm the oldest of my mm-hmm. four siblings, and um, I was t- oh my three siblings, sorry. And I told them that told myself that I couldn't let them see me. I had to be the strong one. I had mm-hmm. to, and mm-hmm. you know, I didn't really know how to deal with it. So of course, I did like any other guy would do. And I'm sorry, I'm not trying to pick on men, but we just tend to do it more than any than it, than our opposite sex. Uh, but I internalized it. I just mm. swallowed it, and um, and you know we we went through that, and uh, yeah, I just never really cried. I never really let it out. And so years passed by, and one day I get a phone call that my uncle Bruce, which is my my father's brother. Um, uh-huh that he passed away while he was on vacation with his wife wow. in St. Lucia. He, oh. uh, he wound up drowning. So oh it was like, it was like in the span of not even maybe four years, I lost like, you know, some of the major keys in our, in our family. Mm-hmm. And by the way, my, my fraternal grandmother is still living in Birmingham right now, 87 mm-hmm. and kicking. Her birthday is actually coming up in another week so she lost oh, both right. of her son both of her sons so it was you know it was one of those things where just didn't know how to deal with it and i didn't really talk to anybody um but at the same time i in 2009 the great thing that i can say is my i had just had my son july two days before my birthday so that's why i always call him my gift mm-hmm. and um he was my motivation to go on and my mom got to see him my father we actually took my father took him up to see my father in Birmingham. So he actually got to meet his very first grandson for the uh, first time. And, you know, shortly after that, they passed away uh, some months later. But yeah. that was still great that they got to see him. So, again, I just couldn't stop. And I can honestly look back and say that now I was probably in a functional depression because I was uh-huh. on the outside. I could still get up. I can go to work. I still carry a smile. I still did everything I had to do, but yeah. I internalized everything. And it wasn't until I moved to Atlanta in 2016 that one day I just had enough and I just let it all out. 
So after that, mm-hmm. I sought there, I sought therapy, and I started yeah. going to therapy, and I never realized how those losses uh, throughout the years mm-hmm. um, affected me in so many ways, from my friendships mm-hmm. to my relationships, and honestly, I'm still mm-hmm. working on that um, mm-hmm. in this in this time. So around the holidays, it used to be where I couldn't even watch Christmas commercials. I didn't. Mm-hmm. I I hate. I even I didn't even want to go on social media because I I couldn't stand when somebody would say, "Oh, I don't know where to get my mom this year," or "I don't know the gift to buy my dad," or you know, a Mother's Day is mm-hmm. horrible. Anything that involved some type of you know family get together, it would just it would just kill me. But I have to say, it was seeing my kids and my family that made me kind of push just push through it because I knew I had to. Yeah. So um, I. That's that's pretty much the quick and, and, and crazy story. I hate to end it on such a such a dreary note, but that's pretty much my story. And that's your story. Um, but again, that's I story. I transcended with the help of my family, my sister. Oh my God, my sister is my world. She mm-hmm. is such, she is my hero. If I can't say it, stress that enough. Um, she has beat cancer twice. She's had um, ovarian cancer. And she beat wow. that. And more recently, in the past couple of years, she's beaten breast cancer. So wow. she has beaten both of those. And I always sit, tell myself that God was kind of preparing us. And you know how sometimes you don't understand, as Bradford alluded to earlier, you, you don't have that understanding. But and, you know, I'll never get over the loss of my mother um, in those aspects. But mm-hmm. I gained an understanding that maybe you were strengthening us for what the battle that my sister was going to have to fight. Mm-hmm. And knowing and, you know, whenever some of my friends or their parents go through it, I can always tell them and give them that testimony. You have to fight. You have to stay happy and positive and just fight. Because my mom, I can honestly say she was a warrior. She fought it all the way up to the end because the last thing she told us was, I just don't want to leave my kids before I have to. And, of course, mm-hmm. we we're all grown by then. But in yeah. her heart, she knew yeah. she did not want to leave us so yeah that's pretty much my my spiel i'm gonna be quiet because <laughs> go. i could i could i'm like angel i could talk all night so we can go. We can go. <laughs> i have i have no doubt and thank you again from from a man's perspective being so open and transparent with your story and how you felt you know for when it happens and the fact that you are still you acknowledge you are still dealing with a lot of that <laughs> loss now and you are you know going through it in a positive way seeking you know, therapy, getting help to process these feelings and the, and the, these thoughts that come to mind. So thank you so much. Patrice, let us into your story. How how okay. does this all fit in for you? Um, so uh, I graduated from high school in 2003, mm-hmm. dating myself here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> graduated from high school in 2003, went into Valdosta State. Um, right? Um, <laughs> but Austin State, 2003, um, 2000, I went home for um, Christmas, mm-hmm. 2003, and my mom kept complaining that her side was hurting. And, you know, my mom wasn't a complainer, so when she mentioned it, you know, it was just, you know, I know she'll be fine, she'll get over it, it's okay. So um, I'm going back to school that, you know, 2004, and I went to go give her a hug. And she was like, ooh. And I said, you need to go to the doctor. And she was like, oh, you know, oh, you know. Typical woman putting it off. You know, she's got three kids. She's been raising them by herself. She didn't have extra money. You know, she's trying to put me through college. Um, but maybe two weeks later, she calls me. And I had just gotten back from biology class. And she says, hey you know, um, went to the doctor and I have breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm a freshman in college. I I hate science. I have no idea exactly what cancer really means. Right. So I am, you know, pulling up all the, you know, I'm getting off the phone with her. I'm researching. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is bad. Um, So, you know, she goes into treatment, everything. She's, you know, um, and the end of 2005, you know, she's fine. She's in remission. You know, they're like, she beat it. It's great. We're good. Everything's good. We're good. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Okay, great. 
So, um, you know, I'm rolling into my senior year, 2006, 2007, um, and maybe that October of 2006, she says, hey, the cancer's back. And I'm like, okay, no problem. She beat it once, mm -hmm. we're good. You know what I mean? Like, we're good, you know? Mm -hmm. she, she like, we're just gonna do it again, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we just, we gotta do it again. You know, it's it's fine, you know, we'll just do it again and it's gonna be okay. Um, well, this time it came back in her hip and um it was in her bones mm. and you know the doctors are like hey whatever you do we just need you to be careful don't fall mm -hmm. because anytime cancer is in your bones if you have a sharp impact it's gonna spread so wow. she spent a lot of time at my grandmother's house you know at her mom's house and she was coming down the stairs and one of my grandmother's stairs was broken she missed that stair and she fell. Mm -hmm. And so the cancer went into her spine and into that spinal fluid and eventually went into her brain. So she had mm -hmm. brain cancer. Um, and so 2000, 2007, May, I graduated um, and from Vasa State and my mom came down and she was supposed to stay the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, but after the ceremony, she was just so sick. She was like, look, I really need to go home. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, no big deal. You know, glad you came down. Glad we got these pictures. You know, you go home. It's fine. Right. Um, so she went home. Um, everything was fine. You know, she was still going through treatment, still going through chemo. And December 18th, she calls me. And my mom wasn't a call. Like, she didn't call you. She wanted you to live your life. She wanted you to be whatever you were going to be, whoever you were going to be, you know? Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, so she called me and she's like, hey, when are you coming home? Mm. And that was a very odd question from my mother. She never, she would never ask me that. And I said, I don't know. You know, I, I have my first grown up job. You know, I was an accountant then. And, you know, I was working at an accounting firm and I was like, you know, I don't know if they're going to let me go home. Um, and so she said, well, OK, well, I said, well, I can be home this weekend. Mm -hmm. And she said, OK. Um, so I got off the phone with her and immediately 10 minutes later, my sister, my oldest sister called me and she said, you need to come home now. Mm hmm. And um, I said, let me talk to my boss, see what I can do. So I went and talked to my boss and she said, you can't go home now. You can't go home until you finish all this work this week. And so I spent all day Monday. I worked until like 10 o'clock that night. I worked until 10 o'clock that Tuesday night. And I worked till like five o'clock that Wednesday to finish everything. So that Wednesday I went home, got home about 10, 30, 11 o'clock because I was four hours away from Boston. Right. And, um, you know, the hospice nurses are there, you know, my mom's in a hospital bed in my house. And I mean, these are things that I hadn't seen because I hadn't been home. You yeah. know, I wasn't I was I was working, you know, yeah. and um, she's not communicating at this point and she's not opening her eyes and she's not saying anything at this point. And so I slept that night in her bed. And, you know, I'm just waiting, hoping. I'm like, mom, I'm here. I just want you to know I'm here. I made it. I came early. Nothing. And Thursday, nothing. Mm -hmm. Friday, nothing. Saturday morning, um, she's like, hey. Mm. And I'm like, mama, I came. I'm here. You know, I, I want you to know I'm here. And literally an hour later, she was gone. Wow. And I was devastated. It was December 22nd. It was 1048 in the morning. And I was devastated. Um, it's just one of those things that you just, you know, when they told me that she was, you know, entering her final stages, I'm like, she's not. I don't know why y'all keep saying that. Mm -hmm. Why we all keep talking about that? It's not. That's not true. Why would you keep saying that? And, and you know, I'm, I'm you know. confident at this point that she's going to beat it. Like, she's going to beat it. Yeah, she's sick, but she's going to beat it. And I guess 
in my 22 year old mind, you know, yeah. I'm like, this is my mom. She's everything. She can be anything. She's, she's superwoman. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And she didn't, she couldn't. And for a long time, for 10 years, I couldn't celebrate Christmas because Christmas was her favorite holiday. Mm -hmm. And she just, that year she had called me at Thanksgiving to ask me to come home and decorate the house. Mm -hmm. And this was the first year that I didn't go. Mm -hmm. And this was the year that she died. Mm -hmm. You know, so when I went home, my niece, who was like six at the time, had like cut out the little paper plate snowflakes mm -hmm. and they had hung them around the house. And that was the only decoration she had. So for a long time, I carried guilt from not going home and doing the one thing that she asked me to. And so for 10 years, I didn't celebrate Christmas. I didn't want to know Christmas was coming. I didn't want to hear anything about Christmas. I stopped going to church. I stopped believing in God for a while. Like I just really shut the world out. Mm -hmm. From the outside, you couldn't tell, but from the inside, I was in a terrible relationship with food. I developed an eating disorder where I would overeat and I would eat and eat and eat until I would vomit. Mm -hmm. And then I would eat again because I didn't know what to do with the emotions. Mm -hmm. And I got up to over 500 pounds mm -hmm. because I just had nowhere to go with the emotions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was always told to like, don't cry, mm. don't, you know, don't be angry, don't be upset, you can't be happy, you just, whatever, <laughs> you just whatever can't be anything. Emotions, mm -hmm. just don't show them to anybody and you're going to be okay, mm -hmm. just push through it. Mm. Um, and Brad has been my best friend for the last 20 years, so mm -hmm. he can tell you that I push through blindly like nobody else, mm -hmm. um, but it was so unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until my father passed away that it kind of mm -hmm. snapped me out of it. Mm -hmm. And I was able to start taking care of myself, lose some weight, start exercising, try to understand where the food addiction, how to control it, how to get over it. And so mm -hmm. it's funny how grief can carry you so far and then turn you around mm -hmm. because I didn't grieve my father like I grieved my mother. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I wasn't close to my father. I didn't really care for him near the end. And he had cancer as well. He had lung cancer, which turned into brain cancer as well. So mm -hmm. it was amazing that they both died from the same disease in the mm -hmm. same general way, um, but his grief turned my life completely in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. um, grieving him helped my life mm -hmm. because had I continued on the path that I was in, I'm pretty sure I would have already died because wow. I just couldn't mm -hmm. stop myself. So grieving my father changed my life. It launched me mm -hmm. into a different person in a different being. And so now I celebrate my mother's mm -hmm. death. You know, yeah. on the second, I go with my daughter and we go and look at the Christmas lights because we always did that as a kid with my mom. Yeah. Always. Um, she would load us in the car. We would go to Checkers. We would all get a Checker burger and some fries. And we would literally drive around for four hours just mm -hmm. looking at Christmas lights mm -hmm. and ooing and awing in the car. Like we were, you know, like it was like at Callaway. Thing. I mean, it was, it was the best thing ever. And we, and we loved it. And yeah. so now I do that with my daughter. I'm always off on the 22nd of December. I don't care what, where I work. Mm -hmm. I already tell my boss, Hey, the 22nd, it is a no go for me. Mm -hmm. You know, that is my day. Yeah. Um, and we just drive around right when it gets dark and we drive until we're about sleep and <laughs> we come back home. And that's, that's the celebration. Yeah. And this year my, my grandmother passed away and um, mm -hmm. my mother's mom mm -hmm. and I, my mother had given her her wedding ring mm -hmm. and I got that back 
mm-hmm. when she passed. Yeah. And it means so, so much. much to me to mm-hmm. have my mother's wedding ring. And now I'm married. Yeah. And I wear her wedding ring more than I wear my wedding ring. <laughs> and the, and my husband supports that. Like mm-hmm. he knows how much that's what matters meant mm-hmm. to me. That's right. And I it's like I, her death now is like good for me. Like mm-hmm. I celebrate it. Mm-hmm. I smile about it. Mm-hmm. I remember her. Yeah. And it wasn't, it's never, no one's relationship with their parents is ever all good. Right. But the bad mm-hmm. teaches a lesson as well. Yes. So. Oh, yeah. I'm just, whew, ah. all right. I just, I just want to say, I mean, <laughs> both to Patrice, thanks for the friendship shout out of over 20 mm-hmm. years. I appreciate mm-hmm. that. You know, that's yeah. real. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But to Patrice and Lawrence, I mean, what you guys have already shared is so powerful and it's just precious. Like these memories, these experiences is so precious. And one of the things that Lawrence was talking about was just kind of the compounding nature of grief Mm -hmm. and how it can just add up. And if we're not processing through it and working through it, that second loss, that third loss, something else could set it off. Mm-hmm. in a way that you're completely unaware of because we can numb ourselves. We can minimize it because life goes on. You have to get back to work. You have children, you have spouses, other things to do and people to care for. But if we're not attending to ourselves and our own well-being, it's going to blow out in, in some area of our life. And that's kind of what Patrice was talking about with the eating. And that's super common. So that's actually called a maladaptive coping skill. Mm. So it's a coping skill because it's actually doing something for you in the moment. It's working. In the moment. So in the moment. So it's pleasurable. So whether we're talking about drugs, food, sex, there's something in that moment that's allowing you to detach Mm -hmm. from the pain of what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. But it's maladaptive in the sense that it's taking you further away from your goals than taking you towards your goals. Mm. So at the end of it, you now have the grief that you're dealing with, but you might also have an addiction. Mm. You have the grief, but you now also have um, maybe sexual partners, you know, more than what you wanted, or you're you're engaging in these relationships. You don't even know why. Mm-hmm. There's an area of your life that's mm-hmm. almost outside of your control, mm-hmm. but what you're really doing mm-hmm. is trying to heal, but you don't know how to do it. Right. You don't Ooh. know how to do it. So almost kind of <laughs> taking away <laughs> the stigma of it, we don't have to blame people. So sometimes when we're seeing people moving about life, life is hard. Life is hard. Mm-hmm. We don't know why they're doing what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And sometimes mm-hmm. we can judge and we can be really critical until you know that person and the situations and the things that they're going through. Mm-hmm. There's this idea, there's this one therapeutic idea that says all of our actions are our best attempts at survival. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Wow. You know, all of our actions. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I work as a substance abuse mm-hmm. counselor as well. And I tell you what, a lot of people pick up because they want to forget. They want to minimize and numb. And then guess what? You do that long enough and now you've created an addiction. So you have to deal with that in addition to the group. Mm-hmm. 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 That was rich. <laughs> Do you mind if I ask a question before we go forward? Just because Bradford just tapped into something and I, I don't want to mm-hmm. miss that opportunity. I'm trying to take notes as well as I'm going Please on. Please do. I'm, I know I'm over and, here and capturing I'm, stuff. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Angel and Bradford. Um, and uh, thank you, Patrice, for that that beautiful testimony. And I, yes. I do have a question for you, Bradford, because I, when I internalize a lot of that pain that I was feeling in, or a lot of that... Um, a lot of the destructive behavior, I never turned to anything as far as like alcohol or drugs or sex or anything of that nature. But I did, I, I realized how I don't, I, I don't want to self diagnose because I, I mean, I, I heard that's one of the worst things you could do. But I like, I always joke with, uh, I always joke with Antonio and I tell him that I have my honorary. Um, psych- psychology degree up on my wall, my <laughs> virtual wall, but um. <laughs> I th- I feel like I developed a sense of uh, abandonment issues, so to speak, mm. to where mm. even in my relationships, because um, I have never been married, 
I've never even been engaged. I, I but I long for that because I'm a very romantic person. I'm a very I believe in love. I saw it growing up for the most part, and I believe in it. Yet I have not found that. I guess you could say that drive to commit and go to it. So although I didn't bounce around from woman to woman or do anything like that, I truly devoted all of my energy and my time and everything to my children. And it wasn't until I started speaking with um, a therapist where they told me your children are going to get older. And yes, you're, they're, they're daddy's boys and daddy's girl, but they're going to get older and they're going to go on with their life. And then what are you gonna, you're going to look back and be like, wow, I didn't live. But I realized that I have had some great women cross my path um, that I've dated uh, to a point, and I would let them get so far in, and then when I felt like, uh oh, there's that feeling of that I'm starting to love them, or I'm starting to get these feelings for them, I would either self sabotage or I would fade away from them because I felt like as soon as they get into my heart, something's gonna happen and they're gonna leave, whether they pass away or whether they just decide to go off and leave or they cheat or do whatever else. I don't want to feel that pain of loss, no matter mm -hmm. which way it comes. Mm -hmm. So although I might not have turned into an outward or substitute uh, something to kind of indulge that pain, is there an explanation as to why I kind of, again, I put all my focus into something that I knew, not, not that I can control, but because I'm the father, I, I have power over that. And I can kind of control my relationship with my kids and things like mm -hmm. that. But with other people, because I can't control your actions and what you do to some extent, mm -hmm. I'll let you in so far. But after that, I, I got to go <laughs> if you get too close. So I fear that that has kind of handicapped me and kind of closed off that romantic and that part of me that 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 desires a wife, a family in that nature. Uh what is that? <laughs> so, yeah, I see. I see Patrice and Angel. Everybody kind of shaking their heads as though, like, I know what that is. And I oh, think we know what that is, head. Bradford. <laughs> <laughs> we know, you know what you, that feels like. <laughs> you hit it on the head. I mean, not wanting mm -hmm. to be hurt is self-preservation, you know. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a way, it's almost minimizing your life. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're making these areas of your life smaller just in order to be safe, because mm. that's what it takes to love, to experience these things is risky. It is. Right. Yeah. You know, it's extremely risky. Um, and so sometimes in all of that pain and in all of that hurt, instead of acting out, we can almost kind of collapse inward. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now we're talking about, OK, I'm shutting down this area of my life. Maybe I'm. I'm even having problems with work or getting outside of my bedroom. Some of the people that I work with, when we're talking about grief, I mean, I've seen entire lives collapse, mm. right? And so it's almost helping them to open back up and, and be willing to risk it because that's what it means to go forward. That's what it means to transcend rather than say, all right, I wanna go ahead and get in the grave with this person mm -hmm. and I'm willing to lose what life I do have. Life is a gift. Mm -hmm. Even though it's painful and it's really hard, when, when our lives collapse in on ourselves like that, what we're saying is I'm willing to lie down with this person I love, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, I don't believe, I don't know them, but I don't know many people who would want that for the survivors. Mm -hmm. You know, if we were to pass, we wouldn't want that for our children, for our friends, for our loved ones. We wouldn't want them to minimize mm -hmm. and end their lives prematurely. So I think you hit it right on its head. I mean, they're they're acting out ways, and then there are ways that of retreating from life. Retreating. Yeah, that's so good. Woo! Come on, y'all. Listen, I hope y'all out there taking these notes. You can um you can uh, DM Bradford to submit your payments for this free session. Okay. Hey, I, I definitely need his information after this call. I need Look, information here. This is, yes, this is good. This is really good. I've, I've been on couches myself for a long, I feel like Lawrence, I've got a lot of people like, oh, I think you missed your calling. No, it's just because I've got a, I've gotten a lot of therapy. Okay. Yes. So, right. <laughs> it's like, I'm just, I'm just, I'm now I'm reinforcing, right? <laughs> what I have been taught. So Angel, Antonia, share your story, and I'm going. I'm going to try not to. All right. Don't make 
Okay. I'm, 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 you know, we got 20 plus years in the game too. So right, right. I'm gonna say that. <laughs> right. Brad and Patrice Tawana and I are the same. We've been friends for over 20 some odd years. So mm-hmm. she's yeah. been through the process she's seen it with all. me. Yes. Oh, yeah. She's yeah. seen it all. The good, the bad, the ugly. She's seen it all. In, um, in but I'm I'm glad. <laughs> I'm I'm so glad that um, you decided not to start with me, but end with me because, you know, Lawrence kicked it off for us. Patrice, you know, got us in there. And now it's like everything that everyone has brought up, I can actually end it and it it all makes sense. Um, So where I began? Okay. I was raised by both of my parents and my grandmother. So my grandmother was like a mom to me. Uh, My parents were military. Um, so uh, growing up, there were times where I stayed with my grandmother at times while my mom was overseas. Um, so she took care of me as, as much as my parents did. Um, when I graduated in 2003, um, I, I took ill. Well, I was ill as a, as a kid, so Tony, you know that. Um, so I've been through a lot as far as with my health is concerned. And can you guys see me okay now we can i was like oh no i was scared to go off to college okay (laughs) i was scared to go off to college um because of my illness so i stayed home um so that year uh, my first year in college at columbus state i got i took ill again and i actually met my ex-husband um he was a transporter at the hospital so he would take me to and from my procedures and um, we actually connected. Um, We started dating, um, moved out together, um, eventually got married. Um, So I went from being taken care of by my parents and my grandmother to going into a marriage at the age of 21. um, And my husband at the time, you know, helping me with illness or whatever the case may be. I've always had somebody there with me. Um, time go on, um, 2012, um, 2011, my grandmother took ill. Um, so it was a long process. Um, one Thursday, uh, in, in, in March, we had a conversation and she told me, you know, when I pass, I'm going to be by myself. And I was like, no, mama, you know, we, we come in, we check on you. You know, somebody's always here. You're going to be, we're not even going to talk about that. Um, that Saturday came, I was supposed to go see her, um, I called her and she just didn't sound the same. I was like, Ma, you know, what's wrong with you? And she was like, no, I'm okay. I said, well, you're talking slow. Your language is slurred. Like, you okay? And she was like, yeah, I'm okay. Um, So I thought I was on my way. Um, 15, 20 minutes later, I got there um, with my niece and nephew. They were two at the time. And I found my grandmother on the ground. Um, At that time of her life, she was falling, having episodes where she would fall and we would come pick her up. Um, this moment she fell and I was like, mom, I'm here. It's okay. I'll get you up. And when I got to her, she didn't move. She didn't say anything. So I touched her and she was cold. So I was like, no, this, you know, this can't be, you know? And so I checked for a pulse. I put my hand underneath her nose and I was like, this is it, you know? So I just let out a loud cry and. I had to pull myself together because I had my niece and nephew with me. I had the baby, so I had to come back to and and call 911. And they, you know, got there and uh, we saw that she was deceased or what have you. So that was really hard to process. That took a toll on not only me, but my entire family. Like, she was the the matriarch of our family. Like, we would celebrate holidays. We were always there at her home (laughs) on the weekends. We would gather there. Um, so that first year we were able to get back together, but after that, everyone just kind of separated. Um, so 2014, my father uh, became ill. Uh, he decided it was at one point he wasn't getting up going to work. So my mom called me and she was like, Hey, your dad is not going to work. And my dad never missed a day of work. So I got there and I was like, Dad, what's, you know, what's wrong? He was like, I'm okay. I'm okay. So my sister and I, Sissy and I, we took him to the hospital and we was like, something's not right. So we stayed there all night. Um, they came back with a diagnosis of stage four cancer. Um, and that following Monday, 
um, we went to the oncologist and they said he had two weeks to live. And I was like, that that can't be, you know, we just found out what, what kind of treatment can we do? What is it that we can do? And it was like, well, your dad doesn't want to do treatment. He wants to go home. He's tired. And I was like, okay, well, I've heard that people can go beyond the time frame that you guys give them. So is there a possibility that we have more time? And he was like, you have two weeks. Um, so of course I'm devastated. I'm a daddy's girl. At that time I was a mom. I was still married. Um, after my mom, my grandmother passed, I, I did have Carlton in 2013. So, and the thing about that is that he was actually supposed to be born on my grandmother's birthday. Um, so that was a blessing after her passing, but I did have Carlton in 2013, um, 2014. Again, my dad took ill and I didn't want to look at my calendar that second Monday because I didn't want to sit there and count the days of how many days I had left with my dad. But that Monday, I got a call about five o'clock and the hospice nurse said, you need to come home. Your, your dad doesn't have too much longer. So I, I raced to my parents' house and uh, my sister at that time was working in um, LaGrange. I called her and I said, hey, you got to come home. Daddy is about to go. So to sit there and see the man that brought you into the world grasping for air, for breath, holding on and to see my mom sit there and tell her, it's okay, you can, you know, you can go, it's okay, it's, I'll be fine, you know. Um, she wasn't able to see him because at that point she was on dialysis, doing dialysis treatment. Um, but my sister finally made it, all of my siblings were there and the death rattle came. So we're just sitting there, just watching my dad just expire in front of us, you know? Um, and again, we all know that day comes. Um, we don't know the day, hour, time, uh, but to just really sit there and just watch not only the man that gave you life, but just someone just take their last breath. Um, so each moment as he's grasping for air, we're like, you know, is this it? Um, so eventually everyone got there and he did take his last breath and our father passed in front of us. Um, <clears throat> 22, 2012 and 2014, I had lost two of the most important people in my life. I lost my grandmother and I lost my dad. So I didn't have time to grieve one loss before I was hit with another. Um, and in between the two, um, I found myself not being a wife, not being a mother, um, trying to understand why I lost my grandmother. I didn't realize that I was neglecting my husband at the time and that I was neglecting my son at the time because I'm trying to get myself together and understand and process everything. Um, when my father passed again, I'm still trying to figure these losses out. Um, so at that time, my mother and I relationship was not good. Um, and one thing about us as African-Americans, we don't, what is therapy? We, we, we don't want to go to therapy. We don't want to talk things out. We want to sweep everything under the rug. We don't want to cash things out. We just want to act as if it doesn't exist. But at that time I was like, you know, I've lost my, my grandmother. I've lost my dad. Mom, we got to get this together. You know, we were, we were so much alike and so stubborn but it was to the point where I was, I was so big on just trying to develop a, a better relationship with her. Um, so at that time we were going to therapy and, and she decided that it was too much for her. So she decided to not go to therapy anyone, but anymore, but I continued to go. Um, so 2016 come, um, after my father passed, me and my husband at that time separated. So now I'm a, a single mom. I'm going through the process of being alone. I'm having to go through the process of doing things on my own. And like I said, I went from being in the household with my parents to going to my husband. So I never had a chance to be by myself in this world, as you say. Um, so 2016 comes, my divorce is final. In February of 2016, uh, me and my mom got into a huge argument um, and we stopped talking. And Tawana, you remember I called you and I said, Tawana, I saw one of Robert's friend in Walmart and they said my mom was in the hospital. Like, I'm so upset with her. 
what should I do? Should I go? And, and you told me, go, go, go see your mom. <laughs> so I went. <laughs> and when I went, I did not realize that within those three months, how her health had failed. Um, and when I got there, uh, of course, we're still mad. At, we're stubborn. We're still mad at each other. And I was like, hey, mom. She was like, hey, you know, she's dry. And so the doctors come in and I knew that she had developed a wound where she was not getting circulation in her leg, in one of her legs. Um, so when they unraveled the bandage, I saw that the wound was so bad that the infection had gotten down to her bone. So when they unraveled the bandage, you can smell the bone and, and the it was it was an awful smell. And so they told my mom, we have to amputate your leg. If not, you're going to die. The infection is going to spread. So we have to amputate. Um, my mother was a master sergeant in the military. She was very independent. Y'all not taking my leg. And I was like, mom, you know, we got to do what the doctor said you have to do, you know? Um, so the very next day she went to surgery. Um, she came out and went into ICU. Um, at the time I was working from home, so I made it my thing to work from home and go sit with her um, at the hospital. And at that time, the white blood cells were so high, the infection spread so bad that it got to her brain. So I'm thinking this is the opportunity. I want to tell my mom I'm sorry. I want to tell her, like, when you get out, you know, when you get home, I'm going to be there. We're going to work this out. Um, and the the, the people of the hospital that were calling me and telling me what we needed to do to get her discharged, to get into, you know, rehabilitation. So every day I would have a call to let me know what I needed to do. They'll call me and give me the status of her. Um, and on June 14th, regular day, I'm getting ready. I get a call from the hospital and it starts off like every other day. Hey, is this Angel? This is, you know, the nurse from St. Francis. Yeah, this is me. And they tell me, well, I'm sorry to tell you your mom passed this morning. Again, let out a loud cry, and I had my baby there at the time. So he's like, "Mommy, it's okay. What? Why are you crying? It's okay. I don't know how I got him a daycare, but I did." Um, and when I got up to the hospital to see my mom laid there, like the only person I had left sitting there, I didn't have the opportunity to apologize. I didn't have the opportunity to fix it. Um, so I had that moment with her, and I talked to her before I called everybody else. Um, and just let her know that I was so sorry. And I felt so guilty that I wasn't there, you know, within those last months. Um, so 2016 was hard. And when I lost my mom, I really, I was so angry. I was angry and I questioned God, like, why, what, what did I do to have everybody that I've ever depended on to leave? What did I, what did I do wrong? What, why do I have to go through this? Um, so in September of that same year, I took ill and I had pneumonia and I had fluid up in my lungs where I was on a breathing treatment. And thank God for, you know, Carlton's dad, he, he kept him through the whole process because after my mom passed, I didn't want to do anything. I was, I was lost. I didn't, I didn't know how to cope. I didn't know how to exist in the world by myself. And so Carlton's dad kept him until I was able to go to therapy and, and get her understanding what was going on. And I realized and I talked to God and I was like, you know what? I get it. You know, my entire life, I always not saying that I'm not a, a spiritual person, not saying that I don't believe in God and I don't have a relationship with him. But I noticed that I always depended on man. And when he took everybody that I ever depended on away from me, it was an eye opener to say, you know, you put so much of your trust, you put so much of your burdens and all of, everything into man when it's supposed to be, the glory is supposed to go to me. So now all I have is God, you know? So I had those moments when I was in the hospital, just praying and meditating and crying and trying to get the strength and understanding to say, you know what, after I leave here, it's just gonna be me. And my motivation was my son because I prayed so hard for him. And I finally was able to give birth to my son. And I was like, I can't fail him. I can't. So it's, it's been a journey. <laughs> it has definitely been a journey. But um, I, ju I just tell anyone, you know, that's going through any loss or anything like that, you know, you have to find 
we all find different ways to cope. Like Patrice said, she coped with eating. Um, with me, I found myself, and I'm just getting it now, and it's 2020. I realized what I was doing is getting in relationships prematurely because I didn't want to be by myself. I didn't know how to be by myself. So I would get in relationships with guys that I barely knew, or I would talk to guys just to just to not be by myself. Mm -hmm. And it's not healthy at all. Not saying that I slept with everyone or anything like that, but just to have some sort of companionship, Company. to have somebody, somebody there, because I didn't know how to be by myself. And then I realized this year, thanks to COVID um, and the quarantine, I had, we had time to just really think about what did it, we had, all we had was time. We couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't do anything. So it put things into perspective and I had to get out of an unhealthy relationship and just realize that it's time to learn how to be by yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to be by yourself. Being by yourself does not, it's not equivalent to being alone. Um, so after all of those losses, um, all of those relationships, unhealthy relationships, after therapy, after accepting everything and learning from everything that I've experienced, I'm now to the point where I'm okay with being alone. And during the holidays, it, it, it fluctuates. Some years I want to just be by myself. Um, other years I do want to be around people. Um, and again, it's a process. It, it doesn't happen overnight. It's never going to be okay, but we have to learn to accept it, to deal with it, to move forward and it's okay to have those moments to be by yourself but don't stay there mm -hmm. um it's okay to go to therapy it's okay to take a medication to calm down that anxiety and that depression it's it's okay and i think as a culture we're so big on not expressing ourselves and just sweeping everything under the rug and just having that outer appearance that we're okay when we're really not and People that know me, I, I try to stay optimistic and positive on Facebook. We all post what we want to post, and I, I choose to post my good days. But I have a lot of bad days, and it's okay to have those bad days, but just don't stay in it. Um, so, again, it's, it, it's a process, and, and everyone has a story. Um, and it's all the, the thing about it is that you learn from it, um, you deal with it, you accept it, and you continue to move forward. Mm -hmm. And and my resilient and my inspiration is my baby. So that's what keeps me going. <laughs> that's what keeps me going. Thank so you that's for my sharing. story. Oh, thank <laughs> you for sharing that. Bradford, I'd love for you to hop in and express, you know, what comes to mind as the professional here in the in the room. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you um, I'm sure you've got something to give us on on that that last share. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, what makes grief and loss so difficult for so many of us is because it's not just losing that person. We're losing that the idea yeah. around that person as well, because we attach so much of ourselves to that person. Like if I'm in a relationship with someone, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm envisioning my future with that person. I'm envisioning what it's going to be like to grow old, to have these experiences. So there's just so many different layers of expectations, you know, and this is for our parents as well. Right. I, I might envision, OK, my parents going to walk me down the aisle mm -hmm. or my parents going to be able to see my child and we're going to have, a, you know, three generations. We're going to be able. There's so much that goes with that. And then when the loss hits. Yeah. All of that can feel like it's robbed from us. Yes. And it all happens at once. You know, and sometimes we can't even articulate what that feels like. It's just so painful. And, and it might even hit us uh, at, at different times of the year, because I've heard, you know, sometimes grief, it can come around like, you know, the seasons, different holidays, as it was mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. you know, where we're reminded of what it's like to, to miss this person and not have this person in our life. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my story, I grew up um, really really fortunate. And I haven't had many uh, significant or close losses. Um, but my father preached in nursing homes and I would go with him from time to time. And it would be multiple nursing homes each Sunday. And that was kind of scary as a little kid. But I'll tell you what, 
it gave me such firsthand experience with the different stages of life mm -hmm. and what it means to go through life and to live it well um, and even to pass over or to die well. Um, how do we do that? So we don't even know what that looks like a lot of the time. It looks like for so many of us, it looks like grief, regret, um, resentments, anger, all of those things, you know, but if we can appreciate the present moment that we have with our loved ones, if we cannot move through this life in kind of an arrogant way where we assume that those who we love are always going to be with us. Right. So, I mean, that's one of the meaning making ways of moving forward throughout all of this is realizing it's coming out on the other end and realizing I each day is a gift. Mm -hmm. Not only for me, but for that other person. Yeah. Right. And so recognizing that and, and saying, all right, how can I honor and love this person each day? Whether it's just a little prayer for them, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's expressing love or reaching out to them. And so when I grew up kind of having some of those experiences and seeing that, it just made me acutely aware that time is precious and it's limited, you know, but but also with that, sometimes when I'm seeing clients, um, I have to work with them and, and it takes so much time because this is such an ingrained um, feeling deeply held sometimes is that we need to sometimes forgive ourselves mm -hmm. um, because we didn't get there soon enough or we didn't express what we wanted to express in that moment. Well, guess what? We're not God. We couldn't have foreseen every instance of how everything was going to play out. And so showing some grace to ourselves is really important. Like I can't express how important that is, especially for moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, acknowledging that we're, we might have failed in that way, but that doesn't make us a failure. And that doesn't negate everything that happened in that relationship. Right. Right. So sometimes yeah. maybe we did lose a loved one and we weren't on the closest of terms. That doesn't take away the love and the moments and the memories that we did have. It was an accident. Yeah. And if we hold that accident over our heads, it can take the rest of our lives. There is no recovery from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to find a way to make a meaning out of it and to move forward in a way that honors the loved one that we lost, but then honors ourselves as well. Yeah, that is so good. Because we dishonor ourselves when we hold that over our head. You know, it was mentioned, faith, faith was mentioned a little bit earlier as a Christian. You know, that's one of the that's one of the things that I love most about the Christian faith is that God doesn't hold these things over our heads. We sometimes have to live with consequences but that he doesn't berate us and remind us constantly of our failures that's and our right. shortcomings, mm -hmm. because at that point, that's very hopeless. Right. And this is this is about gaining hope, yes, not not staying in a hopeless place. I love that. I love that. And you went in a direction that you I absolutely wanted us to go as far as what are some ways, right? If we had to, if we had to wrap this thing on up tonight, what are some ways that people can move forward in grace and hope with self, with others? Because I know I have not had um, many personal losses. I just had, I had, uh, for the first time I had a friend die, you know, this year. And I was just like, what? What? Why? This doesn't make sense, right? Like, no, she was so young. She was a wife for 15 years. Right? She's got four kids. Like, who just goes to sleep and doesn't get up the next day? Like, who does that? Like, why does that happen? Like, and, that, and it, took me, it took me to a place where I was like, whoa, like, I, I grieved disappointment, but I've, I've not grieved death in that way. And, you know, to hear all of your stories and to, try to grab because I can't sit here and say I understand but to try to grab your truth and to just make try to make some sense of it and to understand like wow God like you really give some people some strength you know like you really give some people another yeah. level of living that so many of us on this earth just couldn't deal with you know and Mm -hmm. I have had disappointment, like I've also been divorced. And what I recognize is that with death, people have people have compassion for that, right? Because, oh, it's not your fault. And, oh, you know, life happens and so on and so forth. But when you go through divorce, people don't realize that's grief too, right? And that's, that's, that's a mm -hmm. death, like you express, um, Brad, for like, it's not just 
difficult because it happened. It's difficult because of the ideal that you had, mm-hmm. like you're grieving the death of the ideal that you committed to, right? But it's like, people feel like, oh, after a few months, get over it. You know, like, it's, you'll be fine, get over it. Or if that person left you, you must have deserved it. So it's your fault. So we have no compassion for you, right? And so it's just like, when you really are trying to to understand, or if you're trying to feel people, be empathetic with people for whatever their situations are, when you think about, like you said, people's actions are a method of survival. You might not understand it. It doesn't make sense, but that we don't always have to take ownership of all of it. We look for opportunities to improve, right? Because we're not perfect, yet we don't have to live in regret. We don't have to live in, you know, we don't have to live in the absence. We can live believing that there is still so much more life to live and and making that choice, because that's a choice, right? Whether we whether we're conscious or not, we're choosing, we're going to be on one end or the other. We're going to exist, right? right? Or we're going to actively live and pursue joy, pursue happiness, pursue other life experiences, even though these are no longer what, right, what we used to experience. And so what are some ways that you suggest that, that people can go forward, you know, and hope beyond grief and beyond disappointment, even if, they don't have the support of the people that they expect, even if they don't have, you know, people don't understand, even if like within themselves, they can go forward and choose to live again. Great question. I think the biggest thing, and this is a frustration that I sometimes experience as a therapist, is how much work I have to put into helping that person realize that they can take their guard down. Mm. Mm -hmm right that we can be vulnerable and it starts with being vulnerable with yourself right so Mm -hmm. stop we have to stop lying to ourselves Mm -hmm. it it comes that's it that's that's a big part right to acknowledge that you know what it does matter i do care about these things i do still feel affected by these things Mm -hmm. and and to let yourself feel those emotions right i don't know the cultural thing guys i don't know but we we can be hard yeah, we can be hard and mm-hmm. and there's not a lot of healing when we're that hard because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. we're not being honest with ourselves, you yeah. know, and so so even even when people come to therapy, that's them reaching out. But I, we spend so much time, so many sessions just helping them. All right. Come back. Come mm-hmm. back. Acknowledge these feelings. I have to sometimes give them a vocabulary. And, and, and words to use to understand what it is that they're feeling. Yeah. Because we're so, we either don't have the vocabulary or we don't have that model before us of how to go through it in a well and in a healthy way. Mm-hmm. So that's the biggest thing. Even if you have to go to a mirror mm-hmm. and it's just you, nobody's looking, nobody else sees or hears and, and allow that guard to come down. Mm-hmm. Speak these truths and say, you know what? I miss my grandmother. I miss this person. That was painful. That was really hard. And allow yourself to just feel that and to emote because that's really important. I believe God gave us these tear ducts for a reason Mm -hmm. to allow us to flush out what's going on, what we're feeling, what we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. So often, again, we're so clogged up and we're so guarded that we just don't even have those flushes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it pretty much, it takes a traumatic event before, you know, a thug tear will fall down, <laughs> you know, and it'll just be a thug tear, that you one. know, we just, we wipe it away and then yeah. I got to go back to work. Wipe it away. I gotta, I gotta right. go. <laughs> like, no, you I just, know. you know, a little dust got in my eye, I'm good. You yeah, know. and we'll make up a reason for why it happened. And and what, when we're doing that, we're not being authentic. We have yeah. to, it starts that we're not being authentic. We're not being human. I think underneath, at, at the base of all of this is our humanity. Yeah. And as we can see, as, we, as we've seen today, it's a shared humanity. You're not going to get through this life mm-hmm. without experiencing what everyone on this panel has talked about. That's right. Mm-hmm. And if you did, you're probably not living yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. so it, it's going to happen and it's a shared experience that we all have. And so we have to just kind of get comfortable with it, with being authentic. So that's probably the biggest thing I would say, mm-hmm. starting there. You know, and then and then also allowing other people to love us. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause so sometimes we do have love around us. 
I often right. see it. I'm like, man, these people are trying to love you, but but we minimize, we shut the door in their face, we we tell them mm -hmm. no, no, thank you. Right, we can care for other people, mm -hmm. but to allow other people to care for us now, that's too far. Ooh. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, we can twenty one talk. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll bend over backwards, drive hours mm -hmm. on the road. I mean, do everything, but to allow mm -hmm. someone to care for us is a humbling experience. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're mm -hmm. not to that either. Yeah. Woo. So it's not just being authentic with yourself, but allowing that love to come in, and that's what it means to be in a good relationship with others, mm -hmm. to give mm -hmm. love, but also to be able to receive love. It's a hurtful thing when somebody shuts you out and you're trying to care for them. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Ooh, these were three good, good, three good solid tips, people. I tried to put them on real time. Okay. Bradford said, be vulnerable, be human, and allow love. These are three practical ways, three realistic ways that we can move forward and navigate any grief any disappointment, any loss, whatever the case may be. There's no matter too big or too small, right? The stories that were shared here today, listen, real life stories, um, real life situations, compounding, right? Compounding circumstances that affected every area of living. They have personally shared with you their, their, their thoughts, how they processed it, how they didn't, and how they were able to go forward, right? So whatever it may be for you, job, house, children, parents, family, friends, cousins, siblings, you name it, okay? We're coming up on the holidays. Whatever it is that you need to navigate, you can do it. You can see it through. You can choose um, to live beyond, right? The grief, the loss, or the disappointment. So long as you have breath in your body, mm -hmm. there is a will and you have the power mm -hmm. to choose it. So thank you all so much, so, so much. Oh my gosh, this panel was so awesome. You guys are so awesome. Thank Thanks you so much for this opportunity. And I would just like to say yeah. lastly here, um, reaching out and getting help. So yeah. whether it's you know faith-based or whether it's a professional counselor, an online grief group, there are grief forums, there are grief workbooks. It's a workbook that I use with a lot of clients. It's called the Grief Recovery Handbook. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. It is amazing. It is a guided, it's about six weeks or so, it's guided. Mm -hmm. And it helps you go through that process. It includes certain rituals. You know, don't get word, don't get weirded out by that word, but 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 these behaviors <laughs> yeah. that we can engage in that will help us get unstuck from our grief. Mm -hmm. You know, so reaching out, there is help out there. There is help. You know, and especially mm -hmm. right now. Um, with so many resources being available online, we have to just become humble with ourselves and acknowledge where we are and then reach out. That's it. That's it. And with that reach out note, Bradford, will you let people know how they can reach you? <laughs> I'm not so good with plugging my business. Um, they can go to just Lithos, Lithos Health. Lithos Counseling. <laughs> Ambassador Patrice, come on and help our brother let out. Let me pub it. There you go. So lithoshealth.com or lithoscounselingandconsulting.com. And I can service anyone across the state of Georgia. And I'm open to accepting phone calls from just about anyone and helping them find resources in their local area mm -hmm. because there's so many counselors that are available. There's so many online support groups and things of that nature. Yeah. You can call a counselor and say, you know what? I don't even, I can't even necessarily work with you, but can you help me find resources? And most counselors will be open to that. Mm -hmm. That is so and good. So that's something I would I would love to be able to help people with, especially during this time. Yes. Please reach out to Bradford. His information is right here on the screen. And after the live, Bradford or Patrice, we're going to put the link in the chat. So that way you guys can access it. You can go back and refer to it. You can save it, copy, paste it wherever you need it to be because he is available. His services, he's willing to help all right thank you all who have joined us live tasha we see you ananya we see you there's so many more people in the esther amisha we see you thank you all so much for joining us and all those i didn't get to mention but we are so grateful that you were here you were bold you were courageous and you were compassionate to share this conversation with us we look forward to doing this again there will not be a transcend with bootstrap dreams this thursday because it's the u.s thanksgiving and y'all i'm gonna be off 
<laughs> I am I am taking some time to just D okay. Um, okay. But we will be back here 7:30 uh what is it December 3rd, right? 7:30 <laughs> December 3rd with another talk and we're going to be talking about business, we're going to be talking about insurance, another one for the culture because we just don't get it. Right. <laughs> right. And we need, <laughs> and we need to start getting it. We need to have coverages, mm -hmm. not just for our cars, not just for our clothes, not just for our houses, but for our lives and for the people who will benefit when we leave them. Wow, this was a beautiful segue. I didn't even plan that. So make sure to join us December 3rd, 7 30 p.m. And everybody here, thank you so much for being here. Thank Panel, hang on with me. Here. When I end the live so we can say our formal see you laters and talk a little bit briefly. All right. All right, Facebook. See you next time. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>